Um, good evening. The uh, planning board meeting on uh, Tuesday, December 1st will come to order. Uh, everything that's on the agenda, are we covering, Gene? Yes, we are. There's, okay, so we will go in order. Uh, the first item is 115 Sutton Hill Road. Uh, request to divide one lot into two lots. So the properties within the R3 zoning district requiring an area of 25,000 square feet, 125 feet of frontage. This is the locus. Um, you can see just, I guess I'll describe it to the south is Sandra Lane. So it's just past the bend on Sutton Hill Road, 115 Sutton Hill. Um, the existing lot has 110 feet of frontage today. It was established pre-subdivision control law. Um, the change will leave it with 25,000 square feet. And the what's been presented is the 110 feet of frontage remaining. The new lot, which is 1B, is identified as a not buildable lot because there is not access to it, so there's no frontage so today. What is the I'm bringing up the A and R now. Okay. So um, it's identified on the plan as not buildable. It's the piece in the back. Yep, but it has 37,000 square feet of area, which meets the area requirement. Um, Tom Zurico is here to present the plan. Okay. Yep. In, in, in the way of um, uh, disclosure and background here, I'm, I'm purchasing the, uh, the house next door, uh, 101 um, Sutton Hill, and, uh, which is an oversized lot in itself, and we're combining this piece with that piece uh, and drawing up currently a, um, you know, a couple of different concepts for subdividing that piece. I'm confused, though. But if you're doing the other... <coughs> You're saying, is it the one on the street there? The, the so, one, the, so this, so this one, is the this existing is the one, one being divided. Yeah, actually. and which is the one that you're talking about? That one there, which is to, to the right of, of the, the A and R subject piece, which is number 101 um, Sutton Hill Road. That's the old, that's Betty Watson's house, the yellow colonial. Um, okay. That's right on the so, corner. So the subject lot is the big L-shaped lot. Correct. The subject, uh, I know you're not doing the second part of what you're doing now, but it would be nice to know what you're kind of contemplating doing. And I have no, no uh, hesitation about, about uh, uh, showing you that. I don't have anything uh, drawn up officially on that yet, John, but what we're thinking about is a three-lot subdivision. Um, there's, about, there's plenty of land. Um, it's nice, nice topography. Um, and it, um, there's, there's two or three different uh, potential layouts for that. For that uh, so how for much that land use. are we talking? How can I have a three lot subdivision if you only have 37,000 square feet? Well, the other lot is 60,000 feet. This one? To be combined with the front. Yeah, the, the 101 Sutton Hill is, is 59,000 and change. So the combined is, uh, whatever that is, about 90,000 square feet. It's an R3 zone. Yeah, so how much frontage does it have? Uh, currently? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, partly, I'm asking the question not because it's directly germane, but if it's in the, I don't want to come back, have you come back six months from now, I want to do something we don't like and say we don't think you can do it, and then you're pissed at us. So uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Better to have some idea what you're trying to do now, even though it's not formally part of the process. Right, and they understand that, and that's why I was, you know, wanted to, to let you know that. I can show you sketches of that if you'd like to see it, John. I don't have anything in large scale. Okay. Um, if, you, if you'd like to have have some idea uh, of, of what so we're thinking does of. Any, with, what's people's pleasure? Yes. Sure, well, yes, why not? Yes, yeah. yeah, why not? Watch my house. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> That's tiny. Oh, it is tiny. You weren't yeah, kidding. It is tiny. Well, actually, I might have a larger scale. These are just conceptual sketches. Essentially creating frontage. Called so you're only talking about one existing two, two, two new ones. So yeah. Do you own this one already or are you are you next buying week. it next week? But you own the other ones. No, I don't own this. So, 
Your frontage for this slot is going to be here. Correct. Frontage is created for this and this through this. There's already two. There's already twin accesses from uh, from Sutton Hill Road, so we'd be adding one driveway. Conceptually, this is a relatively low impact. We tried to keep as much of it outside of the watershed. It's really going to be less impervious area inside the watershed than there is today in the post-development scenario here. How can I pay if you're building well, two Because we're getting houses. rid of this, this, all of this asphalt here, and it gets minimized because we're just so putting in that. The watershed line is that dotted line. Watershed is only to here. Oh, the watershed is only to there. So there's no house construction or anything in this concept, John. Relatively low impact. Relatively so the forward. thing that you're going to eventually have to demonstrate is that you can actually put this in you're, I, I don't think you are going to put it in, but you have to demonstrate that you can put it in That's and correct. the geometries all work. Yeah, exactly. We've done this before uh, on a number of occasions, as you know, at Turkey Hill and, and, and uh, at my dad's house, uh, other places over, over the years. Uh, relatively straightforward concept. Um, you know, the geometry makes sense. The topography is gentle. The site is, you know, is... Right. I mean, was, I remember not too far from there, and I forget where it was, we got into a thing where somebody was trying to do this, but the lot was a little bit too small, so they had to shrink the geography of the cul-de-sac in order to get the rights, and we said no, because it was too small. So yeah, that's the, the kind of problem I want to avoid. Yeah, and you see on that concept there that, that you see some of the geometry altered, but the geometry works with fully conforming geometry. Um, so it, you know, we, we've already thought that through, and we've gone through the. So is the is, is the access to this lot going to be over this thing, or are you going to continue to come out here? This the, the existing house would, would access from here, right? This this twin driveway. So there's a, there's a loop driveway currently, two curb cuts. We would come out in the same location here. Isn't that doesn't that defeat the purpose of a subdivision in the frontage when we have um, requirement for frontage? Three, current, three driveways in the same span that we'd have one. And that's why we have a minimum. Yeah, I mean, if you were doing this, we'd make them come out under there. Yeah, so I mean, why would we let them do a subdivision without doing a road and then have three curves? Because you're, you you're actually, you, you would, this would, you're accessing that over your frontage. On which, on which lot, John? This one. If you're doing this, you're not accessing over your frontage. Oh, yes, you are. No, you're not. This is not frontage. This is the frontage of well, the this lot. Is, this is frontage, right? This is all frontage, John. This is all frontage. No, it's not. It's, it's not the, you don't have fit. This is not uh, the frontage in your lot. This is the, uh, your frontage is here. No, oh, no, it starts here. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. It starts here. Well, why does it start there? Because that's <laughs> how you, that's, that's the new roadway, because you don't but, have, but, but how many a, feet is this between here and here? It's feet. What's that? It's about 25 feet. Yeah, it's, it, you can't, your frontage is based on the distance from here to here. Up here, your frontage is not based on on that. Why, why is it not based on that one? That's because the front lot line. That's, yeah, it's a lot line, but that's not the frontage. Your frontage is here. Your this is too on, small. Your frontage is on the road of your subdivision, not the... So well. that's what I mean. So we're, we're going off topic, but uh, that, we're going to come back with that. So that's the issue yeah. you've got. So yeah. just, I, it, you know, my, my only point is before warned that this is going to be an absolute slam dunk. And I get that. And, you know, honestly, if, it, if it's something where we have to build a cul-de-sac, then we'll build a cul-de-sac. It's, it's, it's know, not a question of building a cul-de-sac. It's where you're accessing the yeah. uh, in order. I mean, in order, in order to have yeah. the access that you'd like. I mean, visibility, sight distance, visibility is fine in both directions. You know, we yeah. have, you know, okay. you know, we typically, uh, you know, there's there's more frontage there than we'd have if we had if we had pork chop lots and driveways associated yeah. with them. Well, here. it's so we the, your front, you're yeah. changing your frontage from one street to the other, and then you're going back out on the other. Street. It's not it's not the frontage. So we'll go. Let's go back to the. The uh, the matter at hand here, the Form A, and does anybody have any questions on the Form A? It's currently lot one A. Is there a note? What? It's currently lot one, correct? Yeah. I don't see that. I don't see the notation on this. Is there a notation that says lot no. one A one? No, I'm not finding it. It doesn't ha doesn't currently have a lot designation. 
It's the 37,100. What's the square. what's the lot? The existing lot numbered. Is it one lot one? The the existing lot is yes, is, is, know. is known as 115. So I guess Lynn's point is, can you put a notation on the plan that says uh, the existing lot is being the large lot, you know, uh, whatever it was called, is being subdivided, is being broken into two? Well, there, I, I thought there were two lots. I thought you said you're buying this one. I thought there are three right now. No, no. I think no, we can. I think sorry. we. I think we confused it by having an okay. advanced discussion, which I, I, you know, I wanted to. I wanted to honor okay. the request because I know you, you folks want to know what we're thinking about. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to hold that back. But currently, there is an L-shaped lot, okay. which is number one fifteen yeah. Sutton Hill Road. Okay. We're dividing that into right. by so the same. So yeah, if you can just put a note on it to that effect. I got it. I just. Okay. I was confused. We'll, yeah. So we'll add that. We'll add that. I think you can use the census map sixty A parcel nine is being divided into. Lot one A and one B. Okay. Sometimes yeah. so you that, want that in the in the field of the plan. In, in, a, nota in, in a notation is fine. Just so okay. that way, when someone goes to find that parcel, you want the history showing what happened to it. All right. So then that's getting divided into one A and one okay. B. Okay. We've re we've referenced the, the the parcel in the notes, but we'll put it right in the field of the plan boldly so that it's yeah. uh, so that it's so that's obvious. Would somebody like to make a motion to elect that direct the planner to sign the form A uh, subject to that uh, condition being placed on the plan? So moved. Okay, motion made. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, folks. Okay. Next item is 288 Sutton Street, Matthews Way Definitive Subdivision Plan. Um, Jean, can you explain to us what's going on here? So 288 Sutton Street was a five-lot definitive subdivision approved in July of 2011. It is um, off of Sutton Street, just past 200 Sutton Street, which most people recognize. So heading up the hill on the left. The Subdivision approval, conditioned installation of home sprinkler systems uh, in the decision, and it was recommended by the fire chief. The applicant is requested to remove that condition and deem the removal as an insubstantial change. Um, John Smolak is here to represent the applicant, which is Steve Smolak. This is, I have the definitive subdivision plan, so that depicts the five lots. Um, subsequent to the approval of the definitive plan, the applicant went to the Z ZBA and was approved for two-family construction on each of these lots. So there'll be 10 units on the five lots. So these are duplexes? They are duplexes, yep. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, and other members of the board, John Smolak representing uh, the applicant. Uh, just as to follow on what uh, Gene had indicated, um, uh, this uh, subdivision did include a, does include, currently include a uh, provision that requires uh, the installation of sprinklers in accordance with the State Building Code. Uh, the State Building Code doesn't require installation of sprinklers in one and two family homes, uh, but uh, we had a discussion with uh, Chief Malnikas and also Jerry Brown, the building inspector, about this very matter. And in your materials, you'll see two letters from them uh, recommending that the condition be uh, stricken for a number of reasons. Um, in several of your most recent subdivision decisions, uh, your definitive approvals and PRD approvals, including Wellington Woods, the PRD, out on Boxford Street, as well as uh, Tom uh, Zarico's uh, project, uh, the Glade, uh, both of those projects did not require the installation of uh, uh, sprinkler systems in those, in those projects. And so let me ask you a question. Yes. Uh, how wide were the roadways in those projects, and how wide were the roadways on this project, and did those projects have hammerheads? Um, the roadway is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a more narrow roadway, that's true, and there is a hammerhead on this project. There the other hammerhead. project and didn't have a hammerhead. None of them have duplexes but, either. Right, but this okay. is a... This is so a, it's not the same. It's not the same, but it's a, it's a different... Pol it's a policy change by the building it's inspector. It's not a policy change, it's circumstances. It's an absolute right? policy change no. by the fire chief who is charged with uh, public safety, and, uh, the upholding of public safety. And based on his, on his determination, he feels... You know, again, the official is charged with public safety that 
uh, sprinklers aren't required in single and family to uh, family dwellings. Uh, Massachusetts, as well as 48 other states, don't require fire sprinklers in single and two family residential dwellings. Massachusetts is in the clear majority of not requiring it. The eighth edition of the state building code doesn't require it. The proposed ninth edition of the building code will not require it. Require it. In addition, if the town wants to impose this requirement, it needs to obtain the approval of the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, the state BBRS, for it to be a validly issued condition. And the town has never done that. So if you look at the memos from the fire chief, he's indicating that the more clear fire safety measure are the measures include the installation of carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors. Sprinklers are property damage protection measures. And, um, and they are clearly exempted from the state building code. And, and North Andover, historically, is the outlier. I don't know of any other city in town of Massachusetts that requires a single uh, fire well, sprinklers. And I know where is, it came from. This is four years after our decision, right? Right. So you didn't appeal the decision. No, that's right. Okay. But, does, but it doesn't mean it's not fair to ask to have a level playing field yeah. with the other, other projects. Well, you keep on saying that's not the same thing. It's different. It's the circumstances are different uh, in this case. But, it, right. But doesn't yeah. the fire chief's uh, determinations charged with fire safety and public safety have any bearing on this? Well, we will take that into yeah. consideration. Right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, it's just there's been a, a policy change with the fire department. And, and I mean, we're not, I don't think we're asking for anything extraordinary, uh, especially since, uh, again, I don't know of any other cities and towns that require this. Uh, and, and, uh, Honestly, right now there's a movement with the fire departments, and I've talked to many of them, to, to require it in two-family homes because you can't dictate what your neighbor does, and we all know that there's never been a fire-related death in a fully sprinkled residential building. Well, you know who's pushing the fire sprinklers? No, it's the State Fire Sprinkler Association. It's... it's <laughs> it is. I, I don't... Can I just interrupt? Because I'm sorry. I, sure. I made this clear at the beginning that I'm recusing myself from this discussion. Okay, just for a conflict. Okay. I have uh, sprinklers right. in um, meeting house comments. Um, you know, I know, I, I worry sometimes that the sprinklers are going to go off and all the furniture is going to be ruined and this will happen in the middle of the night and it'll be freezing outside and I'll be wet going out. But I feel safer mm -hmm. having sprinklers in the house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I worry about what the people next to me are going to be doing. Well, in your circumstance, it's, it's different. It's, it's different no, because it's it is a multi. It is not considered a single or two-family yeah, structure. Yeah, but since we're talking different right. circumstances, right? But also, we could look for. I mean, it's it's a matter of degree of safety. I mean, do you? Uh, I mean, if you go to fire sprinklers in this circumstance, do you do you build a, a fire station every every you know, fifty blocks? No. It's, it's a matter of degree of safety that, uh, that the uh, town is willing to live with. And in this circumstance, I think, I, I, you know, I would hope the board would take uh, the uh, fire chief's position into consideration. Uh, fire chief is not a, a, you know, a brand new fire official. He's seen what damage has occurred. I mean, the building inspector in the memo that I've supplied to you has indicated that in his 11 years of, uh, of as the building inspector in North Andover, he's had at least one uh, sprinkler failure per year. He's had 11 fire sprinklers uh, fail with thousands of dollars of property damage. Insurance companies don't require them. Insurance companies do provide a, a credit, but the credit's only maybe on average, on the average house, maybe 80 to $100 a year. So, so, spend 15% of the building right. portion of the limit, which is a pretty substantial discount. Because right, but they feel that right. they're safer because I did a, I've written, I've written a lot of insurance. And they, that's a huge credit, 10 to 15 percent on the, off the comprehensive portion of the policy. So right, right. Well, let the let the builder decide whether it's worth putting sprinklers in, and let the homeowner decide whether they want the option of installing sprinklers. 36 states in Massachusetts in the in the country affirmatively have taken affirmative uh, steps to eliminate the requirement to uh, impose requirements for installation of sprinklers in single and two-family homes. So, so. I think the clear majority of this country <laughs> feels a little bit different from historically how the town is, has dealt with this. And it's, what are you act specifically proposing to replace 
these sprinklers. You talk about well, uh, CO, to, uh, you know, CO detectors. Yeah, what's Will they be hardwired? I, I believe uh, they absolutely yes. That's required by the building code. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's a code requirement. And the uh, and CO detectors. CO detectors. Correct. Hardware. Correct. Like and. Well, it's, it's an unnecessary cost. I mean, the cost for those sprinklers, and it ranges anywhere from six to seven to $15,000 per unit. I mean, if we're trying to encourage affordability of housing, this is something that puts housing affordability through the roof. I mean, it's one of many factors. Um, you're putting in granite, you're putting in stainless appliances. Yeah, I mean, yeah, these, well, that- Life safety, I mean, you're talking about, I've personally seen two fatalities in non-sprinkler buildings, personally. Right, but were they brand I, new houses, or were they old houses? They were They were code uh, eight, as far as the addition, so. Okay, code. but- So, right. I mean, they were well, they were built well, and they, they would have been a lot well, more dust if the fire walls weren't there, but the, they- the vast majority of houses, uh, I mean, the houses that are built today to code really have great fire resistance. But it doesn't stop someone in the house from dying from... Well, neither does falling over a stairwell. No, but, <laughs> but it's such a small cost on initial construction. I mean... It, it's it, not a small cost. Well, comparative to other things in your house, I mean, it, they work. I mean, it's a fact. Right, but if the, if the uh, if Massachusetts doesn't require it, why, why do well, we feel that there are so specialized local conditions that require us to impose well, this condition? Well, there's been movement from Massachusetts requiring, but unfortunately, the building and the realtor group is bigger than the fire department um, group in all honesty. Well, I've been involved with the Phoenix Society, the Burns Society and stuff, and they've, there's been, they've been trying to get it passed for years, and they, they hit a wall because the lobbying group on the other side is just 10 times larger, well, times larger. Well, maybe it makes common sense from a national basis yeah, not I to mean, require those I sprinklers. I think we're, we're sort of getting at a two things here. There's a general policy issue obviously involved that sits at a level higher than us and then there's the specific circumstances here and well, let's try to focus primarily on that. Does, mm -hmm. uh, Lynn, do you have any other questions specifically well, or would comments? We have, would we have given these waivers if we weren't going to, I mean, would we allow a hammerhead so the fire, fire department truck can't turn around if they weren't putting sprinklers. I don't know. I wasn't involved with that yeah, discussion. I mean, that's, I, I guess, would a you little bit. My to, point is that it's, it's a narrower lot. It's a hammerhead. Right. It's more density than we typically have. And get, that but, was the circumstance right. in which we, we, we approved that. And that was the context mm -hmm. which we approved it. Yeah, did but the get, fire chief is saying that it's not necessary. I mean, why get, are you substituting your judgment for the fire chief's judgment? I mean, it is ultimately your decision, but you have to rely on your fire safety people. <laughs> To, yep. to to make these determinations. Well, he's not here. He was he wasn't involved in this discussion. I don't believe on the road and the sign on. So, so, John, I had discussion okay. with the chief subsequent and explained. He told me the letter was forthcoming, and I explained yeah. kind of how the condition gets in place and the fact that the subdivision is approved with waivers and the hammerhead and the width of the road and whatnot. And he acknowledged he didn't understand that side of it. He he was fine with the letter he submitted. He he stood by the letter, but. He also understood that the planning board has a role in approving that subdivision plan. Right. What he, what he has said is in the letter, and I had the discussion. I, I laid out the subdivision uh, before and before, and he actually, uh, when the subdivision was approved, I laid out the approval. I laid out the hammerhead form way back yep. when as well, and so uh, he was aware of those those conditions at the time. I'm not going to speak for him, but what I can do is speak to his letter, which says. Basically, that uh, you know, the Massachusetts State Building Code does not mandate the installation of springers in one and two-family dwellings. Um, I believe you've noticed that in the last several residential subdivisions, we've been asked to comment on uh, the fire department has not requested uh, sprinkler systems to be required for these projects, and as our policy has changed, to not require sprinkler systems in single-family two homes when the State Building Code doesn't require them. I don't think it could be any more clear in terms of what the position is. Yeah. Required. Are required. So, uh, any, are we ready to make a determination? I think it's, it would be a vote to either grant or uh, deny the uh, request for, an ins for a finding of an insubstantial change. How many, how, what other waivers were there? I mean, were there lots, it looks like there was lot size waivers, there was a, I mean, would they have been able to build 10? I mean, in a traditional. No, the so big was, thing is yeah. the width of the road and so, the hammerhead. So they got. So the, the density was increased substantially. No, no, the density wasn't increased. We had a proof plan. 
uh, that we submitted as part of the subdivision, the density wasn't increased. No, it was because you got a 64 light road. Yeah, but we had to provide you with a proof plan that we could demonstrate that we could provide a conforming road, which we did. So then, well, it's a 16 foot wide road. There's a hammerhead. So, with Lynn or Dave, do you want to make a motion? First of all, I don't think it's a substantial change, so I'll make a motion that I don't believe this, the 288 Southern Street, the removal of the requirement and the special permit is a substantial change. So the motion is to deem it as a substantial uh, change. As a substantial change, not to approve it as an insubstantial change. Correct, because that's what's before us. You want to second that? Is <laughs> Does that mean that we approve it, but only as a substantial change? No, well, that's no. The next, that's the next thing. It's only, okay. we only can do one step. Okay, design. I agree. Yeah. I believe it's a substantial change to the intent of the original approval. Okay. I, so will you second the motion? I will second the motion. So the, the motion is that the planning board deems this a substantial change and therefore would deny the request for it to be an insubstantial change to remove the requirement. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Add, add one thing. Um, did anyone read the building inspector letter or the fire department letter? Did all of you read it all? So motion made and seconded. Uh, any further conversation? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Then give me one. Aye. Yeah, Sorry. so it's three votes to zero. Sorry. I think it's a poor decision. It's a poor policy. Okay, moving right along. Uh, 575 Osgood Street, Edgewood Retirement. Um, community. It sits on approximately 82 acres of land. So the locus is here. The abutting property is a parcel that is approximately 20 acres of land owned by the Rockwell Estate. Um, Bob Capola is here from Edgewood to present a small house concept that Edgewood is very interested in pursuing. Let me, uh, when you're done, I just want to add some comments because uh, I've been involved in some of these discussions, okay. so. I, I think it would be best to, for Bob to provide the overview of the project and then we can dis discuss the details, but right. what, what will be presented will involve um, Warren articles at town meeting. Yeah. The, the, the situation here, I don't know how people are familiar with the whole Edgewood property, but the Edgewood property is zoned as a one of the, it's continuing care retirement center. It allows um, uh, housing and other uses for elderly in, in a certain environment. And it was set up, I think, probably about, I'm going to guess, 15, 18 years ago. And um, uh, Gene is right that uh, if we approve this, it will uh, require some zoning changes. Basically, the zoning allows only for a certain number of units to be built. So this would exceed the cap slightly uh, in the number of units. And it also allows, uh, under the existing zoning, you can use acreage in an R1 district uh, to get your total density, but you can't build in an R1 uh, district. And in this case, it would be uh, actually some building in the R1 district as well. Uh, the, the, well, I'll let Mr. Coppola speak about the, the merits of it and all the pieces of it, but that's the context of it is that this is a proposal we would eventually see, but the first step of it is that we would have to pass zoning changes. So we, we pretty much have to feel comfortable with the approach and the logic of everything in order to uh, support the zoning changes, so. Before, I have a question on the context. Why was there a cap? Any reasoning behind a cap? And we cap, didn't year did want a from? project to be too large, uh, that it would be overwhelming, because if you had a 500 unit thing, it would be on a scale okay. similar to nothing else in okay. our So I think we said that it was around 200. Okay, that exactly. cap that goes back to maybe the 80s? Or back in the late late 80s. Okay, yeah. so the population, we, we took 35 year population change. Yeah, well, it's so not so much of that. It's just a question of how much too. footprint right. do you okay. want in a, no, in a given yeah. location. Today is 
Okay. Is it 250? Yeah, yeah, I, okay. yeah. So it is 250. Okay. Yeah. So is the proposal to increase that cap? Well, there's two pieces to it. One piece would be that uh, because of what's going to be built here, that we would we would have to increase the cap slightly. And the second piece is we'd have to allow building one a portion of the R1 zone because that's or, where the building would occur. Or we zone a portion of it to R2. So. So we or, well, you, you really can't uh, because it's on the other side of the watershed line. Uh, but you can't. You, the zoning but, maps and zoning map. The R1 district's the R1 district. Right, but the the watershed extends into property other than R1. It goes all the way out to Lisa Lane and. No, that's true. But the right. point is that it's. R1 is exclusively in the watershed district. In other words, right. the definition of R1 yep. is residential building, yep. and yeah. And in this case, the uh, the provision for this district did not allow any building in the R1 component right. of the parcel, and you would have to allow that as part of this. So, okay. so it's all yours. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. I'm Bob Capola, director of facilities at Edgewood, and I have with me tonight uh, Paul Hedstrom from Hinkley Allen. John McMecking and um, Ken Costello from SMRT. And we will have to say before we start that we have an emeritus member of the planning board sitting out there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right, Jewett. Yes, yes. Everything I learned about planning, I learned from Paul. From Paul. So, uh, Good. <laughs> um, so we just want to introduce the, the project to you at this point, certainly. and. Um, talk a little bit about Edgewood. And our mission at Edgewood is to offer services to seniors, which allows them to be the architects of their own well-being. Um, in keeping with this mission, what we are looking at doing is a small home concept uh, for the types of building here and using that design and that philosophy. Traditionally, in an assisted living uh, facility, you have 40 to 90 units per, per building. They could be multi-level. Um, they're long corridors. Uh, there's various rooms with dining rooms, tables, etc. All of those pieces, enclosed living rooms, nurses station, and it's more of a compartmentalized um, building. What we're looking to do is the small home concept, which it, it provides for an inviting single home element for 10 to no more than 12 people. What we're looking at is uh, there's four pods on the end, and there'd be 10 bedrooms uh, per pod. And what that has is it has more of a feeling of being at home, a home atmosphere, which for folks with dementia is very important to give them that at-home feeling. It'll have a fully functional kitchen for each unit of, of 10 beds um, because, you know, food and the atmosphere of food is very important in homes. A lot of people, that's where you gather is in your kitchen or in your dining room. So you're trying to emulate that same piece for folks as they deal with, um, with dementia. Um, it, each room is a private bedroom with a shower at each location, is what you have in that small comb concept. And it's an end suite, so, you know, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to get folks, you're giving them destinations to come out. So the positioning of the bedrooms around the kitchen, the living room, it's purposeful so that the smells of the home, of the cooking and all that are enticing and, and you're trying to engage people to bring them out of their, out of their rooms. In that other model, they have a tendency to stay in the rooms because it's, it's not as inviting in long corridors or, or confusing for folks. Um, you know, food is a, a very important part of that small home piece, not just from a nutritional standpoint, but for drawing them out and engaging them, socializing, activities, all of those pieces. And, and in this concept, the, the residents would actually be assisting with some of those pieces, so they would be able to assist with food preparation, making their dinners, you know, they would decide um, as a group, because you would have a table that would seat 10 people that could all have dinner at the same time, or they would have smaller tables so that it could be more intimate for them. So you're really trying to really engage them and draw them into that piece. Um, probably one of the other important things of the small home concept is that you have, a, you have people, so you traditionally, you know, you have electricians that come in and change light bulbs, you have janitors or or housekeepers that clean. In the small home concept, you're not introducing new people all the time. It would be that core group of people. So, you know, you're not just a custodian, you're not just a, a housekeeper, you're not just a, a CNA. You're all of those pieces so that you're engaging those people and, and helping them with those daily activities. Because when you have a lot of people that come in, it adds confusion, et cetera, to, uh, to them. So you, you really want to make it a, a home feeling, and that's really the the, the, the key to this whole piece. Um, 
it also, you know, you're trying to encourage them to utilize the spaces independently by being able to come out of the dining room and, you know, you have craft areas set up within that room, similar to what we do, you know, in our daily, daily homes as well. Um, you're encouraging relationship building. You know, all of those, those pieces to give quality of life is, is really what it comes down to. You're trying to make sure that, that people have the most quality of life that they can, um, certainly when they get up to be in, at those ages. You know, the intimate size of it, it as I said, it really in, encourages relationships between staff, uh, residents. Um, you know, there is privacy, certainly, by them having their own rooms, et cetera. They're still afforded all those other pieces, but it is important for them to, to engage and, and to do those pieces. Um, there is a, a project that's called White Oaks um, that's located in Westwood, West, Westwood Mass. I'm trying to say Westwood. Westwood. Um, so if you wanted to take a look at that, you could see, which would give you some, some idea of how that whole concept works. And I, I think we had sent some pictures yeah, along pictures. as well. What's that? Do you have any pictures of that? That's quite the easiest way. So. Yeah, we can definitely send some over to you. Uh, was there any in the original one? I'm not sure. But we can, we can send that so you can see it. But so that you get the concept, you know, your, your bedrooms are on the perimeter naturally around there, and then your, your other pieces, your core areas are where that, those other functions would occur. Uh, but we can. This isn't a new concept that you've developed there, right? This actually is a, a concept that um, the uh, Veterans Administration has just approved. So, on any um, military housing, retirement housing, uh, nursing home style, it's all going to be in this small home concept because you really want to draw the people out. It's a, it, you want to engage people. You want to get them out of their rooms because it doesn't do anybody any good just to be isolated in their own room. You really want to engage them to give them a quality of life. And you also want to engage them outside um, and that's also a key for us for this whole for this piece as well as that you want to also have them enjoy the outside or the of the facility so you know you'd have some some fenced in areas etc because you wouldn't want people to to wander you know you want to keep them close but you still want to give them that independence so that they would be able to do that and that's similar to what um, was done when they did the um, the addition the last time I think it was 2008 so you have some areas that residents are allowed to go outside into, but it's enclosed so that they can't wander because we don't want anybody to, uh, to wander while they're here. Um, the buildings, of, now this is a conceptual design at this point. Uh, we haven't engaged SMRT to actually do the, the building layouts completely. We use some square footages from um, that White Oak, as I told you, and a couple of other places to, to get an idea of rough size on the buildings. You know, we're looking at approximately a 15 or a 16,000 square build, foot building, each one, depending on how we do the interior fit outs of them. But that's the range of magnitude that we're looking at um, to make sure that we can fit all of those pieces within that space. And one story, right? One story, one story buildings. And you folks familiar with the cottages that we built at Edgewood back in 08? So Edgewood built a series of cottages um, and, and, you know, they used specific colors to, to really have them be absorbed within that environment where they are because, you know, you want it to be low key, low impact. And I think they were very successful. I think, John, you've, you certainly have, have seen I, those. I and wish other people would build things like that in, uh, in town because they really are very nice. If you've never been over to look at them, you really nice. should take a look. Yeah. Yeah. Where, is, yeah. where is the lake in relation to this? The lake is down here. Okay. Yeah, the lake is down this way. Um, and so what we're looking at is to use approximately five plus or minus acres of that parcel, and then the balance, the 15 plus or minus, would be conservation restricted. And you, you know, if, if you wanted to, we could show you the, the conservation restricted land that's around Edgewood. Edgewood, um, through Sam Rockwell, um, who was the original visionary, I believe, for the project, you know, open space was important, and, and Edgewood is continuing that, that mantra moving forward that we want to keep as much open space there as we can. I mean, one of the things is that this parcel is the only, in that area, the only privately owned parcel. And the town at one time had expressed some interest in purchasing it. Um, what I think this does, if we can make it work well, is effectively get virtually the same impact uh, as that preserve the land and not have to have the town shell out the money for it. So, uh, you know, 
the devil's in the details, but I think that's one of the considerations here is that this would be a parcel of open space that we would have purchased. Now we don't have to purchase it, but we'll get most of it in a conservation restriction. And I think also that you, you did say that you would give the town a, uh, an easement through the property so people can walk from. Yep, there are existing trails that are there now on that parcel, and we would certainly continue those trails, you know, yeah, tie in around the building. People want to go from Ware Hill over to the town. Yep, property. absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And as you know, Edgewood is open. I mean, we yep. allow folks to do that now, and we would continue to do that on that piece. I just have a couple of questions on the design of the buildings. Um, you said they're 15 to 16,000 square feet for 10 to 12 people? 10 to 12 well, residents? There's, there's or is that 15? 10 to 12, so there's 20 per, per building. Okay. Of 10 bedrooms each. Okay, I was going to say, because that's, that's an awful lot of space yeah. for a yeah. person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so that's a total, it's a total of 40 beds that we're looking to construct. They're really not small houses. When I saw the little title, I was thinking a little 400 yeah, foot, you know, <laughs> house. I'm like really disappointed <laughs> they're not really small houses. I understand your concept. <laughs> it's the um, small home concept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to see little houses. <laughs> okay. Um, and. The one thing I notice is that right now there's no sidewalks connecting from building to building or up to the main. I don't know if that's if, if we not, will, or if because the the patients, the type not patients, but the type of a, a elderly uh, care, they would be walking from building to building. There or? will be sidewalks, as we said. Okay. This is just conceptual okay, just at, yeah, just at this point as we're trying to. We what we wanted to do was present what we feel is the worst case scenario, okay. building size, etc., to mean, show you that to some degree. You know, my concern has been that uh, you want to make this as nestled into the land as possible so if, when you're up at the top of Half Mile right. Hill, you actually, you don't prominently right. see it. And um, I think it's, you know, they, you can see they've, you've started the process of doing that and tucking right. it in and there's probably a, some yeah. other nips and tucks yeah. that we can do to, to right. make it better as, as you proceed through the yeah. process. This also looks like you probably don't need as much parking. No, I don't. Because yeah. none of them are driving. None of them are driving. That's correct. So they will not be operating be vehicles. That often. Yeah. I know we have a ratio, but we probably would be a reasonable way waiver, you know, yeah. Yeah. if none of them drive, yeah. you know, yep. figuring out what your staff would be. Yeah. And in the concept, yeah. we are still, you, the parking yeah. naturally would still be there for Half Mile Hill right. as, we, as it currently exists. Any other questions from the board? What? Where is the dividing line between where uh, they would that be allowed to build? Is it to well, the it depends when you say not be allowed to build. They uh, <coughs> under the CCRC, the whole parcel is in the R1. Basically, okay. the edge of the parcel is the dividing line between the the watershed district. It's right. it's the interestingly enough, you wouldn't know it as you were if you were there because it's perfectly flat. And then to basically close to the property line on the right, it starts to slope down. But it is technically on the watershed side. So, Laura, do you have any questions? No, I think it looks great. Okay. Are, are you staking anything or out there? I wonder if you could just put a few stakes in, so if anybody from the board ever just comes out, they could. Have yeah, what would you What would you like us to maybe stake some of the corners, rough yeah, corners? Yeah, maybe the the some of the corners if you could. I mean, sure. it, don't do anything too elaborate, but that way yeah. we can on our own go out there and see. Yeah, we could take care of that, and that'll give you an approximation. Yeah. Particularly where you plan to have the uh, the paved areas, you know, the, the parking well, that's areas. Be a lot of staking. Well, yeah, but um, would it be more productive to have a walk through so they don't have to stay here? Thing that's no. What's that, Jane? Yes. Staking have to be on different property stuff. Well, uh, or no, Bob. Would you maybe what we could do is uh, the easier might be just to uh, you know uh, to take a walk out there for the absolutely board. when you yeah. whenever anybody would like to do that whether it's during the day or in the e afternoon, early you, morning, I'm Saturday, thinking, Sunday. I mean. We could, one of the ways to do it is just like on a Saturday morning, just Absolutely. You let morning. us know what you want yeah. to do, and we can set okay. that up. And, this and Saturday. I mean, uh, I'm not going to be here, but I've already seen it. So uh, I'm actually I'm not right. available this Saturday. I have a commitment already. Okay. But I could do next Saturday. Next Saturday? <laughs> okay, how about next Saturday? <laughs> not this Saturday, next Saturday. Okay. Uh, yeah, what time? What day is next Saturday? 
12th. 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 Whatever time you want. Yeah. Okay. 10 a.m. Okay. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. December 12th. Uh, <laughs> eight's fine with me. Okay. Okay. Eight o'clock. Huh? Eight thirty. I'll get my own private tour. I'll do You'd let me know, and we'll we'll class. give you the tour. <laughs> so what time do we agree on? Eight. 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 Okay. I, okay. Yeah. Eight thirty. Yeah. That's okay. Make it eight o'clock. See, I'm the opposite. Where I go to sleep on Saturday morning. <laughs> it's the only time I got. So. Bring the kids on a walk. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do that. That was fun. So okay. Any uh, anything else? Anything Any else? other questions from the board? The other piece that we, we just wanted to mention that this, you know, Edgewood has independent living. Uh, we have a nursing home facility. And so this is, this is that completion of that is because it would be considered assisted living. Yeah. And so we just want to make sure that you understand that piece, that that then brings us full circle on that whole yeah, continuum. Yeah, I think the use is, is of, it's part of the continuum of use. Part of the continuum. Yeah. And yeah. There, is a, there is a huge need for assisted living just in the Merrimack Valley alone. And, and that's why, how we've come up with this idea because it, it's, you know, the numbers are staggering for the folks that are gonna require assisted living. And is any part of it geared towards Alzheimer's specifically? I noticed you mentioned that. No. It's, it's dementia, yes, dementia. which is, okay. yes. Yep, it, it, you know, is there the potential that there, yeah, I know. that as that, you know, as this population shifts that some of it could be um, people with physical limitations as well, yes. We're not, but which primarily we're gearing it towards that dementia. But it, you know, it could be multi-use if you needed to. If you, if you have folks with physical li limitations, you could use it the same way. And is Edgewood currently at the 250 max, or? We are at uh, 242, I think, right now, of the 250. Plus, yeah. yeah. And so we'd need to go up to the 290 yeah. to, to do that. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate okay. that. Yep. Thank you. We'll see everybody on the 12th at yeah. 8 a.m. I might. I may. This. Yeah. Thank you very much. It'll probably be snowy. It's the only day I sleep in. Yep. Thank you. Oh. Okay, moving right along. Verizon Wireless. Oh no, wireless. Yeah. Help, help. <laughs> <laughs> Who else was on the board from the old wireless board? I, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I got the last one with it. With yeah. Oh, you're yeah. going to love this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the board wanted if I sit here and stand because I wanted to hook up my computer to do Yeah, that's fine. Picture, so. That's fine. So recently, Verizon submitted a building permit application to install cloud radio access network, what they call CRAN, wireless communication antenna that would be mounted on an existing utility pole. The specific utility pole was outside of the Jasmine Plaza on Route 114. However, they've entered into an agreement with National Grid to install 30 plus of these type of antennas on sure, existing so. utility poles. Um, <laughs> Since they're not a typical tower or structure mount facilities, I thought they should come to the board yeah. kind of explain the visual impact as well as potential locations for these within the town. Um, are they geared towards Route 114, 125 type streets or potentially could they be in the downtown common area um, just to determine permitting requirements because obviously th they don't fit in easily with our wireless yeah. facility by law. Okay. Good evening, board members. My name is Chris Winiarski, and I'm an attorney representing Verizon Wireless. So, really, we're here tonight seeking a waiver of the special permit and site plan review and approval requirements of Section 8.9. And the reason for that is it's really found in the first line of your bylaw. If you look at the first line of 8.9, 
So that is, it is the express purpose of this bylaw to minimize the visual and environmental impacts. And then there's a, a lot more text, but we know we're talking about wireless communication facilities. This is how we are trying to minimize the impacts all across America right now. This goes on top of a utility pole. Um, it's designed to look just like a transformer. This is the real thing. This is an actual antenna. Um, I have behind you a picture of a transformer on a utility pole. Uh, as you can see, it really looks exactly the same. Um, additionally, I have some other sample photographs here. So at the top of that pole, is that a mounted canister? Th th that's a transformer. What about oh, the very top? Yes, exactly. So that's so they do go at the very top, not on the side. Well, what I'm going to show you on the, a few different pictures here is that they go in different places depending okay. on the actual poll um, and the actual need. So what we're proposing now would be top mounted, which would look more like. this. Sorry, let me just scroll down a little. Right, so as you can see, it really is designed to look exactly like the equipment that is on your average utility pole everywhere in America. Um, people probably most likely will not notice this at all, just like you don't notice the transformers that are on the poles right now. The trick here, however, is that this does not replace your average um, wireless communications facility. This is a deployment of many, many antennas, uh, depending on the demand in the area. It could be 10, 20, 30, even more. Um, so to go through the process of trying to do 30 special permit applications and site plan review applications, especially when you start examining the minutia of the bylaw, which is very similar to bylaws all over Massachusetts, it becomes almost impossible to do, and it makes this entire project completely not feasible. Um, I like to think that most municipalities would rather we do this. This is modern. Everywhere that we're doing this now, uh, all over Massachusetts, would rather have this than more towers or more rooftop designs. But everywhere that we're doing this right now also does not have a provision in their bylaw that addresses this type of installation because it is very new. Um, literally, we've started doing this, um, it's been not even a month since we've started these things. So we're here to get some input and figure out how we can make this work so that we can have these in North Andover, thus providing better service, which as you can all imagine is in demand and that demand is growing at a phenomenal rate. Um, we think this is the best way to do it. We need to figure out a way how we can do it. So, <laughs> so is this like an amplifier for nope. what's already, you're saying it's not going to replace. So what is it going to, what's going to be different from what we have in town now? How is it going to change? Yep, I, I can explain. What you have in town now and, and all over the nation now are what we call macro sites. So you, you can have either a tower or rooftop installation with multiple antennas. Now that's designed to cover a very broad area, um, mm -hmm. and generally in a ring, but not necessarily in an exact ring. And what happens with that and what is happening now is that you get too much use of the capacity of the network. Um, you can think of it as being similar to bandwidth on your wireless router at home. It works fine if two people are using it. If you have 20 friends over using it, it doesn't work fine anymore. That's very similar to the situation with all networks in America right now. You have these macro facilities, whether it's a tower or a rooftop, that cover very large areas, but they can't handle the demand in that area. There's mm -hmm. too much use. And that's simply because of the proliferation of mobile devices that we call mm -hmm. smartphones um, and tablets. They, they use a lot of bandwidth, whereas voice calls did not use very much bandwidth. So the ones that are already there are going to stay there? Absolutely. Be additional? Absolutely. So what this does is addresses those very specific bandwidth needs, the places where we see very specific high demand. This doesn't go 180 feet in the air as a tower does. This goes down very low, and it goes in areas where the population and the usage is dense. And I 
I, I shouldn't really say population, it's the usage that we're concerned with. Um, typically the two go hand in hand, but not necessarily. So this is a way of um, densifying the network coverage into the areas that it is needed, um, as opposed to creating large structures that just spread the coverage all over, and oftentimes provide coverage in areas where it's not needed. It, it's sort of a a win-win situation, really, because, this, like I said, this does not create much of a visual impact at all. Um, that's my opinion, but that's why I brought it here, so you can is see it. Is there equipment required, or is there additional the, radio? No, there are also uh, radio heads, which are boxes um, generally about that wide, that thick, this tall. Those are flush mounted to the pole, and those are very typical, again, to the junction boxes, boxes that you see. And what height are those? Um, it's going to vary depending on the particular pole and where the space is. On, on this specific installation, I can flip to the plans uh, because I don't remember off the top of my head. Sorry, I have to make it larger. I can't see it. So, so on the spec sheet submitted. Oh, so you can't see mine, so that's what I'm bringing. And that, but. All these are big boxes on the telephone. You see a couple more. Oh, 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 I see what you The boxes are lower. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the, 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 we're talking about the boxes, not that. Right. Right. Okay. Oh, right. So if you look at the plans, it, it's it's these boxes here, which are flush mounted to the pole, just in the same way that other utility equipment is. Do you have any actual photos of an actual installation? Could you have like three lines of two-inch conduit it looks like on your plan yep. and then you have these boxes and the electrical uh, this is an actual meter. installation oh no, right. well i don't want to see the top the top's not the concern it's the stuff that's going to be at eye level yeah. Yeah. okay that doesn't look like it has two-inch conduit running down it either that pole so conduit runs from that um, to there the is top. a conduit run right here okay uh, and there's a little bit of a shadow but again, and you can see the conduit run better here. And that, of course, could be painted any color that you know the town would want it to be. Where close by to the Andover, do you have one of these thingies? I don't see an electrical meter on that one either. You know, that's a good question. Let me let me ask some of the guys that are with me. I'm I'm not sure if we do have any up right so now. So we would be like the first. Uh, in Oh, we do have Amesbury already? Yeah, next week we're going to trade with Amesbury. Next week. So next week we have three going up in Amesbury, um, which we can give you those addresses for sure. Um, you will that, be... That would be great to, to have that. Just to be yeah. Interested. What I would say is you'll be among the first uh, because we're, we're doing this in a lot of cities right now. Um, and I'm not the only one doing it, but I know I'm doing it in a lot of places. Um, so you'd be among the first. And, yeah, we can we can get you those um, addresses and For Verizon Wireless, I guess you represent. Yes. Okay. Um, there are other cell phone companies that presumably have the same need to put these things on. I would say similar need. I mean, I can't speak exactly to what their need is and what they're doing, but I think this technology will be something that is utilized by other companies in one form or another, yeah. So it's possible we could have a lot of these things yeah. sitting on the telephone poles. Yeah, just as the telephone poles now, um, just looking at the one right outside the window, three transformers on it. Yeah. Um, and that, that's part of the design. It's to, to make it such that if you did need more than one, it still does not look out of place. It, it's truly unnoticeable, just as the transformers on utility poles are unnoticeable. Um, you know, be, Before I came to the first meeting where I discussed these, I looked at the utility pole at the top of my driveway um, and realized there's one right there. I, I would have never noticed it. It's just not something you think about, not something you've noticed. Um, They've, they've been there for 30, 40 years, and it's really not going to look different. So that, that plays into my next question. Some of the utility poles are very old. Um, so is the plan going to be to make sure that 
they're stable enough to support your equipment, their equipment for some time, and not just put a pole against it and support it. You know, you see that? The double pole. I hate yeah. that. Yeah. I hate the double them. pole. <laughs> yeah. I, we I don't mean, want a snowstorm and, and poles are coming down because these are heavy or... Well, again, the, the reason why the... Sorry, not again. The reason why poles come down uh, it's not because of the weight of the equipment on the pole. It's because of a pole on the wires connected to the pole, usually a tree bulb or wires. This, um, if you don't mind me approaching. It's not heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 28 pounds, I think. It's not well, light. You wouldn't want to carry it around all day, but it's not, that heavy. It's not making a telephone pole. But again. still, and I'm saying some pole, we, we live in a town with old poles still. We do do a structural analysis on okay. the pole. That's a requirement. That's of our the answer. Reading. Okay. Um, that's the scientific answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rocket ship. <laughs> so, what uh, what do you foresee as the locations? Is it in dense areas within town, yeah. or is it potentially rural areas as well, or is it? It's going to be in dense areas and areas with dense demand, which, yeah. as I said, <clears throat> typically correlates to population, but not 100. percent I mean, there there are places where there is dense population and not dense demand for wireless. The one that comes to mind is a church. You can't talk on your phone in church. Um, but other than that, typically where you have dense population is where you're going to have dense demand. Rural areas, um, these are not going to be deployed and they're not going to work for the simple reason that you need to get over trees. And these are not designed for that. As I was saying before, these are designed to really pinpoint on very, very specific areas of demand. Rural areas don't have those specific areas of demand. It's more widespread, and that's where you will still get your coverage from the more conventional facilities that we've been doing for the last 20 years or so. Do you have any um, dimensions on the equipment that's going lower on the poles? I, I, yeah. I don't disagree that these transformers are very are not very visible. I disagree with you regarding the lower equipment because I've seen some on other poles um, that and you have no dimensions on your plan sheet on that equipment. Also, it's a 60 amp service for this. That's pretty high service. You you're running three phase. For a little, for a it little. seems to be like you know much more about electrical service than me, but. <laughs> <laughs> grew up in an electrical engineer's home. I did not. Um, John, is that a question that you can answer, or should I? Almost one time service. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is the service that we need for the remote radio head. Um, no, you're right. This particular one does not give the dim Oh, it does. Right below, you can see the dimensions, 37 inches high. Um, do you guys have screens in front of you showing what's on the? Yes. OK. Yes. So right here, you have the dimensions. Okay. So three feet by one foot by six. With the, with the, now, is that the whole? Because that is electrical meter also. Below that, correct? Yeah, the electrical meter is going to be the electrical meter that is required by the utility. We don't have a special meter that we use. Um, it's it, they dictate that. And any oh, thanks. Labels on this or anything like that? Signage that you have going to gonna have to have. Required? No signage. Um, there are warning labels on the components, as with every electronical component. Um, even your phone, if you were to take the battery out, has a little warning label on the back, but nothing that you're seeing. Well, the, the thing being is if it's a telephone in front of my house and all of a sudden there's this big junction box that's three feet, you know, at eye level, you know. Um, yeah, these are not at eye level. Well, it's saying that that's at five feet on your plan. <laughs> no, that's the meter. Okay, and then the meter is, what, ten inches? And then, so that's at six feet? It starts? That's what I'm saying. It does, I don't know because it's not... So if you live in a two-family house... Yeah, the family. Right. Box right there at eye level, you know. So that's what I'm, that's why I'm asking about that type of equipment, not the type of stuff at the top of the pole. We I think we need more information on that. You I know, can I can get you that, but we're, we're uh, the basic equipment is a ten seven hundred your remote radio is going to be fifteen feet. 
Right, so if you, if you guys are looking at the screen where I'm showing you here, this is the bottom, and this is 10 feet to the bottom. So the center line, as John was saying, is 15 feet, 20 feet here. The meter is what you're seeing, and what this is saying is five feet to eight and a half feet, according to what the utility company requires. We don't have control over where the meter is placed. Can you get the equipment up higher? The rest of the equipment? Well, the question becomes, is that better? Um, as it, you know, when you put it higher, it's actually more visible. So, I, I don't know, can we put it up higher? I mean, does that make any difference? Well, so, I, I thought it would be more like the attractive nuisance kind of thing if, oh, look, kids are coming along, I can reach that thing, and maybe I can play around with it. But then again, I mean, I assume the utility... Where are you getting these 15-foot tall kids? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm talking about if they were like eight feet or something like that. Right. But, uh, well, I mean, and that's the meter. Um, yeah. and, and meters are pretty locked down, and again, we don't control that, but, you know, yeah, just like and, the meter uh, on your house, yeah. that's at usually three feet because it has to be... Well, it used to have to be read. These days, they don't actually have to read meters anymore, um, and that's why we can put them that tall. But I, I, no, I understand what you're saying. You don't want it to be low enough so that it can be accessed by people, and we don't want it to be that low right. either. But at this height, I think access is difficult. I would never say impossible. Um, but I have to say, you don't see that much. You don't hear about kids climbing telephone poles it's much. Not anymore. Well, they don't have the. They took off the spikes. Use. Yeah. There's, there's a lot yeah. of them still out there on oh, the really? old poles we have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do they use these anywhere else in the country? Or everywhere, and, we, and this will. So we this could, will be everywhere. We could Google and see what what people are saying about them. Yeah. They're using them. Yeah. I mean, like I said, this is new, so they're going to be everywhere. I don't know that there has been that much deployment of this yet. It, it's very new. Okay. And my other question is, I mean, I kind of feel odd about just giving a point, you know, just a blanket. Okay, you well, can put I out a hundred of these things. My feeling I, is I'm, I I'm sympathetic with this, but I think that we should go to town council and spend a little bit of time thinking about it. Maybe you should talk to the town manager because I, I think I vaguely remember in the back of my mind that the Board of Selectmen have some statutory responsibility over utility poles. Right, and I, I did review this with the town manager. He's definitely interested in locations, you know, where we're talking about yeah, these. Yeah, yeah. 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 but yeah. 114 yeah. I'm not as concerned about, right. but a residential street, I, yeah. and, you know. Yeah. And the I do not want to have the jurisdiction over this. Personal. They do. Yeah. Yeah. 114, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, except we need bandwidth in the library. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, know. I, That's, yeah. yeah, I guess one of the like, questions. How that I would, close to the on ramp of 495? Fine. Yeah. Not like on the side streets in the library. The, the question I would have in a typical deployment, okay, get it, you, you do your engineering, you figure out where the gaps are, but how is that likely to play itself out? Is it likely to be that you would put one every 100 yards, or would you do literally every pole? I'm, I'm, Again, it's going to vary a lot by demand, and it's going to change. It's not going to remain the same. And so we would not be opposed to doing this in the way utility companies do it and you know, seeking a license from the town council in this case. I think you have a town council, right? Oh, the town manager, board of selectmen. Oh, okay, board of selectmen, um, you know, for new locations. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. That makes sense. Um, you know, as I said, the difficult part is the special permanent site yeah. plan review, the I mean, timeline involved. the perfect way to do it because there's a little bit of oversight that we would like, but the, our process is really meant for the, the bigger things. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. So would you envision deployment of five at a time? But you, you submit an application, I believe, to just one on Turnpike Street. Right, this is the is, first one. Is that typical? It would be one at a time, five at a time? No, or it, would, it would probably ramp up. So you okay. probably, after we get this one, done and we figure out how we want to do this, you'd probably see five come. And then you may see another batch of ten come a month or two after that. And these, in theory, are exactly like the tall towers. When you're on the phone and you drive out of the range of one, another one picks it up and you don't realize it's happened. 
So yep. That's how it drops your calls. Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this Don't is for a reason. go back to the dark ages. <laughs> right. It, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but essentially, yeah, there's designed to be an overlap between this, but also the existing coverage in all these areas, because these areas all have coverage. Um, and it is seamless. It's not as if you're going to be switching from one of these and you're going to notice a switch when you drive out of the range of this into no, the next one. I don't think you will, but there will be a lot more switching. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, that's the point. We, we did have, a, a few years back, a lot of concerns from, the res from some residents about radiation coming from these devices. Mm -hmm. I'll, this, where have you gotten with that? Because I, I would think if you've permitted any of these before, you know that the emissions, the, the RF emissions, um, are governed by federal law and specifically preempted. And, and, but there's a reason for that, and there, there's a reason they take that out of the hands of, uh, of a planning board or a zoning board or, or e even the state, for that matter, has no regulation over that anymore. It's because you don't have the resources to evaluate it, and they, it would be a lot to ask of any board to try to evaluate all of that. I, I like to sort of compare that to whether the board would regulate um, prescription drugs, you know, certainly you do site plan review if CVS is going to come to town, but but you're not going to evaluate what drugs they're selling at CVS. No, I just because... don't want to get involved in that type of thing again. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, you can throw yeah, me under the bus yeah, if, yeah, any, yeah, if yeah, anyone yeah. raises the issue. I have no problem with that. So uh, I, no. I, I have a question. So are you going to share bandwidth with like Comcast or anyone else, or is this no? It, I mean, this is totally different technology. So no, the the antenna works for us. It it has nothing to do with it. So they're going to so, be coming in six months to us? So this is strictly for Verizon calls? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so somebody who's on a, a different network would get Is there get another the network? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't build a network for our competitors. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> what was the process of being um, I have to get back to you. I don't recall. Do you guys know? All right. So Amesbury required an electrical permit only. These guys were involved in it. Electrical permit. Not even a building permit. Uh, it just, I want to go back again to the question that I had: is is the likely use case going to be like? every pole on a street or is it going to be like every fifth pole or is there it's, it's not likely to be every pole on the street because there's not that much demand in north andover it's not that dense yet i mean i can't say that's not what it's going to be like in 50 years but in, the other carriers follow so well the other carriers right. are going to so pick one, up that yeah, yeah. Right. They, they would likely go on the other poles yeah. Yeah. right yeah. so then it could be one per pole depending it's, on the it's entirely other. possible you must have information at this point that you know that that bandwidth need is right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so I don't have it share, right in front yeah, of me. But we're, you could share that with us as to <coughs> this is a, your town and this is where we're seeing the real need. Well, without a doubt. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a, as we start figuring out exactly where we want to place these, um, we would be rolling them out to you. And I, like I said, that's coming very, very soon. Okay. That, that's what would be interesting then, to know whether these are going around our common area or our library area or 114 or 45. Well, they can't be around the common. There's no there's utilities. No utilities. No utilities. <laughs> They're going to be in areas. I, I know there's not going to be one in my neighborhood because there's no new utility poles. But uh. yeah, they'll be in areas of, as we said, dense population primarily. So that's, that's, that's library area, Main yeah. Street. And yeah. Yeah, is there, downtown area. I mean, so this is worse in a, in a library area than a, a rooftop installation. No, I'm not saying it's it's better or worse. We're just trying to get a sense of yeah. where these are likely. And yeah, and that's going to be. I mean, what I would say is, we it. don't want to impede the wheels of progress. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of a neat concept. You know, obviously we're trying to put our heads around because it's something that we don't completely understand. I agree with you. It doesn't fit with our regular bylaw. It would be insane to have special permits for each and every one of these, uh, and that's not at all our intent. I think we just need to do a little bit of due diligence with mm -hmm. our board of selectmen before we sort of 
you know, go quite blotch, but I think you've been pretty receptive. You're, I, I think probably one of your next steps would be to go to one of the select men's meetings after Gene's had a chance to talk to the town manager okay. uh, about this. I just think that's the right way, and the license approach yeah. may be the ideal. Yeah. Uh, and that makes sense. It's already done. Oh, you've already done that? Yes. Excellent. Oh, well, good for you. And if we could get the addresses of the Amesbury yeah. yeah. installations. I will get you those. Yes, yeah. enough. There's a good pizza, yeah. good flatbread oh. place up there. A couple of good restaurants. <laughs> So I can revisit it in terms of a licensing approach as opposed to a special permit, yeah. whether that's... I think that would be a better uh, better approach, uh, especially since, like I think you said, some can be in the right away. And yeah. The select could have a... Uh, I uh, do have a function, I think, that they regularly on, perform related to... On new poles, right, when, yeah. when new pole installations, is yeah. my understanding. So. so these are going to go on existing poles. Right. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that makes sense. This is what not about... the city? In the city, there are a lot of them on light poles, and in the city, you do have them on every block. Um, and But light poles is just one example. I mean, in the city, the demand is so high, you put them anywhere you can possibly put them. Um, I and mean, we have in-building systems in many of the hotels. So, like, I, uh, I work in the back bay. Mm -hmm. If I walk around and pay attention, will I see these? No. In Back Bay, I don't know that there has been much deployment. It de depends on the street and the residential streets of Back Bay. Yeah. Not yet. Um, up and down Boylston, yeah. Yeah, okay. already there. Yep, um, Huntington Ave, already yeah. there. Okay. We're, we're doing them in um, all three hotels on Boylston, inside the buildings, actually. Okay. Uh, so, yes, it, yeah. these are already in Boston. You yeah. probably didn't notice them, though. Yeah. Uh, but that's not, the point. Not on the light poles in Back Bay. Um, I don't know if they're on light poles in Back Bay. There's, there's no light, there's no uh, telephone poles in Back Bay and Beacon Hill. They're all underground wiring too. No, I. What I'm saying though, there are well, light buildings. They're on top of roofs. There are light fixture poles in the financial district, the the street lights, and that's where we have them. Financial, yeah. yeah. That much I know. Back Bay, off the top of my head, I yeah. I don't know. Um, I'll just pay attention. Just yeah, I would look. I mean, the, <laughs> can you put this one, sorry, on a building instead of a pole? Uh, it would look weird, don't you think? I, I, I suppose it's possible. It depends on the roof structure of the building. We but do. I'm thinking of one that we were just looking at for a very long time, and there was a surround thing like this tall around the well, edge, yeah, so you, you, you can put it up there and you see it. Yeah. We, have, we have done designs where there is an antenna just like this on a building where it is uh, a very similar demand, for instance, in a um, shopping center that you know has a, a very high demand in the parking lot um, this works there for the same reason if you can put it in the right spot on the building it will do the job um, but it, it's not really a, a replacement for other rooftop facilities it's, it's something pretty different because again as I was saying this is designed to really focus on one particular small dense area like, of what, need what, what's the area the square footage you're talking about like that will serve till where three blocks down or one block down or ten well, blocks down it it really varies in the height you put it at okay but um, at, at the top at, at the top of a light pole <laughs> at this location you're talking about is about 30 feet how, how what's the range you have to know that the range it I mean, I'm sorry that it really is so much more complicated than that. So if we if we say we're going to put it at 30 feet in the desert, totally flat, no obstructions. Um, I don't know, guys. Help me out. What are, the what one are you're one you're, you're proposing are, right here. Right. You have to know what. Well, I think what they're saying is the obstructions. So yeah, no, but, but, but this one right here. Yeah, they, but they, I mean, the one they're trying to permit. This one. Yeah, but doesn't it depend on the amount of people using that? But they've selected bandwidth? Turnpike Street, 740 Turnpike, I believe. Okay, so, so what, right. what, would that, yeah. what would that support? I, I don't know the exact range. Okay. I'll find out for you. Okay. But I don't know. I mean, I mean, the number of users doesn't change. How, how often do you right. have yeah, right. 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 I mean, the number yeah. of users. Is it a mile? Is it a quarter right. mile? Right. Exactly. They do know that. It's neither a mile nor a quarter mile. We're, we're talking like closer to 100 to 200 feet. So then they're going to have to okay. go. Yeah, so they will have to repeat. Yeah, that's yeah. not right. Yeah. Every yeah. antenna. Every yeah. Yeah. But that's the exact point. So I, I want to be yeah. clear about what we're doing. This is not a mini cell tower. This is the exact opposite. This is densification putting the coverage everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the ideal would be to have this on every pole. 
or but you your don't. Car. <laughs> well, the fiber optic cables that they connect to would be really long if you put them in the car and they get tangled eventually. So um, the thing is, again, as I was saying, it, it depends on the demand. So I, it's hard to say what the demand in North Andover is going to be, but the demand is what dictates how, how frequent these are going to be placed. And when the demand grows, the placement grows. You know, we, we may need them here and here today. And then all of a sudden, there may be a sports complex built here. That's very high demand. You might need one here then, in between the two. So it's hard to say. And I, 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 there are no black and white answers to your questions because it, it's a moving target constantly. This is meant to follow the demand does in that, a non visual way. Does the National it's, Grid it's, lock up that pole for only Verizon? Or could no. the A pole be? No. It doesn't lock it up. No. We, I mean, there's no exclusivity for the particular no. poles. I mean, you think about it, it's, it's the ability to scale usually is really what you're doing here, exactly. right? I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly hardly cost you anything for that next increment, so you don't have extra capacity. Right. Uh, but more yeah. importantly, we also don't waste resources on providing unnecessary coverage. Yeah. Right. You know, if we have a dense area here and we build a tower to hit it and it covers the conservation land here, that's a big waste. Right, right. Uh, so, big yeah, waste so for the town, too. Use your capacity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, okay. it, it maximizes the efficiency of the network. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. I think we got it. Yeah. Good job. Thank you, guys. Okay. So, so what is our next step? Should we be in touch about going for the city? I'm uh, sorry, the Board of Selectmen? Um, I'll get back to you on the next step that way, but there was a few open questions. If yep. You could send that information. I'll send it in in the next couple of days. Yeah. And right. then I'll talk to the town manager to see. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. The next evolution will be putting them in your teeth. Be the best way, wouldn't it? Just a little implant. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I went to a show. I was yeah. That's been the myth. For a long, the myth for a long time. That's what it is. It's the government. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. So the selectmen voted to establish the Osgood Landing Spot Growth Overlay District Committee. So we, we talked at that last meeting, John. You weren't here for that. Um, what they're we looking. We not. You got it. Um, no, essentially that the, the um, so Eric Kafori is going to chair the committee, and the town manager has recommended that someone from the board serve on that committee. So Lynn expressed interest at the last meeting. Peter also did as a somewhat second to Lynn, if, if. Yeah. I also said you want to do it, you're welcome. No, you, um, can, uh, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. So, so the selectmen yeah. have requested a vote by the board. Oh, OK. So with, uh, who would? I nominate Lynn. To be? The representative for the Osgood Smart Growth Overlay District Committee? Yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. Congratulations. Ooh. Ooh. Full work, zero pay. <laughs> <laughs> More work. Yes. <laughs> More responsibility. Eric just asked that I communicate that that establishment of that committee is kind of a step towards um, really starting to work on the master plan Good. again, um, which is going to be a comprehensive master plan. It's going to, they're actually going to try to budget mon money to. Yeah, we do get that going. Plan. We should spend it. Technically, it should come, it's supposed to come through us from a statutory yes. perspective, yep. and we've been a little bit remiss on it. It's a lot of work. Yep. It's a huge amount of work because you bring everybody into town in, and you got to probably, my experience has been in the past, you got to find somebody in the town that wants to actually lead the thing because it's, you know, you could, in a year, you could work 500 hours easy on something like this. So you, you got to have somebody that's a glutton for punishment, but <laughs> it has, has some brains too, you know. Um, uh, he acknowledges it'll be a comprehensive effort. Yeah. Um, and they're going to budget money, but in conjunction with that, actually, the first phase of that, um, he's working towards trying to recodify the bylaw and hiring an outside consultant, kind of yeah, ahead well, of. You know, maybe we ought to invite him in to talk about okay. what he's up to, just because okay. if, if anything he's doing is he's moving a little bit different direction than us, we ought to step back on that and, yeah. you know, get consensus. Yeah. So maybe That's have fine. him come in. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, recodifying it is just kind of the first step, just taking it and finding 
places that we can either condense or yeah, I mean, fix a little but bit. But the question that ends up being is, you you want to do that in context. I mean, there's a certain amount of cleanup you might want to do yeah. anyway, but you also may want to look at your zoning in the context of your master plan. So you don't want to do it twice. That's right. my point. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I will ask him to come to the next. Well, the next meeting has a really full agenda. So. Um, we have three new public hearings really? starting, and we have some pretty significant discussion items as well. So okay. I will talk to Eric and see <laughs> what yeah, his timetable we'll is. is. Yeah. Um, so. But yes, December 15th is full. Yeah. What else we got? That's all I have. How about the minutes? One change. John, yes, have John opening the meeting. He was absent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, sort of neat trick. Right? Yeah. I was a bad trillicus. So I'll make a motion to approve the November 17th meeting minutes as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you.